أحمده وصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد <coughs> Today uh, my talk is directed not only to the Salafi brothers but also to the students and the teachers and the mashayikh of Darul Alum <coughs> It's very important to understand the reasoning for the Salafi Wahhabi movement. And today I'm going to expose some aspects of this historically because anyone that has sat with the Salafi brothers or watched their videos or spent time with them, especially their teachers, they have an inherent dislike and a distrust specifically towards Imam Abu Hanifa. What is the reason for this? There's this kind of like cognitive dissidence. On the one side, they will say, follow the first three generations. On the other side, they will follow their own interpretation and the books of Bukhari and Muslim, which came 300 years after the Prophet <clears throat> And will ignore the fuqaha like Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, who were in the time of the Salaf, who were part of the Salaf, who were part and parcel of the very definition of what it means to be Salaf. They were the A'immas of the Salaf. So why did the Wahhabi movement have a allergic reaction to Imam Abu Hanifa? It had an allergic reaction to Imam Abu Hanifa because first of all, the Ottomans, which of course they weren't perfect, they were not the perfect Khilafah. It, you can even argue they were not the Khilafah, they were just kings. But anyhow, they were kings that, who had allegiance to the Muslim world. <clears throat> and they weren't stooges and puppeteers of others. And so, because the Ottoman Empire was Hanafi, so when the Wahhabi movement launched a movement, it had to be against that very fiqah, that or that very mazhab, that was implemented by the Ottoman Khilafah. This is one reason, but this is the apparent reason. This is not the real reason. I'm going to come to the real reason. Let me ask about the real reason like this. Why? Would they want you to bypass the entire history of Muslim scholars, with the exception of few, namely Imam Taymiyyah and Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab being the two most prominent? They want you to bypass the entire history of the Muslim Ummah and only stick to quote unquote Quran and Sunnah. Because is it because there's something that if they teach from the scholars of Islam throughout Muslim history that it would hurt, that it can potentially hurt the kings? And so the kings needed and their, uh, the puppeteers, the puppet masters of the kings, they needed an Islam that was compatible to their demands. As you know, the Wahhabi movement worked perfectly with the British Empire. <clears throat> this is the whole thing. They create an attitude of animosity towards Muslims, remove love from the picture completely, being very strict on the Muslims, very judgmental on the Muslims. And they have a sense of gratitude and bootlicking towards the disbelievers. So now... When they say Quran and Sunnah, they're bypassing the entire Muslim history so that you're not able to understand how Muslim scholars dealt and felt about kingship and people in authority. So anyone who goes to Medina University is taught you cannot, you cannot, you cannot speak against the leader. And so we have now YouTubers that are becoming famous, who are going to tell you, you cannot talk against the Muslim leader. What garbage and what rubbish. This would become apparently clear, very manifestly clear, if 
They studied history. The reason they don't want you to study Abu Hanifa is because he rebelled multiple times against the Umayyads. I'm going to show you. The reason they don't want you to, to look at Imam Malik is because he also rebelled against the kings. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal rebelled against the kings. Imam Shafi didn't really like the kings. They, they were very fearful of him. So Imam Jassas, the great Mufassir of the Qur'an, Abu Bakr al-Jassas, he wrote Ahkamul Qur'an, the tafsir, famous tafsir of Islamic jurisprudence. In there he talks about Abu Hanifa and his opinion about selecting the Khalifa and overthrowing the Khalifa and not his opinion but Imam Abu Hanifa who is from the Salaf and this is what they feared. They wanted to create a tailored version of Islam that had some appealing aspects like Tawheed for example, going against Bid'ah for example. But all of that Islam should be tailored to the puppet masters. So, from the tafsir of Imam Jassas, I'm going to show you exactly the position of uh, Imam Jassas, the famous uh, Mufassir of Quran. Uh, let me just uh, show you quickly. And show. So, we'll be reading from the first volume, page number, I think, 86 it is of <clears throat> the first volume, it's in two volumes, Ahkam al-Qur'an, Imam Jassas, he was, uh, uh, he came into uh, the scene about close to the 4th century, okay, 300, year 380, okay, so he wrote this tafsir, and now he's a Hanafi scholar, he's a Hanafi mufassir of Qur'an, so now let me show you uh, what he says, okay. Imam Jassas said about Imam Abu Hanifa. And why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this to express that why would the kings want an Islam? Okay? Why would the kings want an Islam that ha that does away with to whom does away with the Hanafi fiqh? Because the Hanafi fiqh was very clear on who the Khalifa can be and how and when the Khalifa should be removed. And this was clear not only in their fatawas, but was also clear in the actions of Abu Hanifa in his own life. So they want to tell you Quran and Sunnah so you don't rebel against the king. That's the reason. And had it not been for Dar al Deoband specifically, the Salafis would have you know, just paved the way for itself. The only thing that stopped the Salafi movement and their ideas was Darul Alum and the ulama of Darul Alum. Now, he says, وَكَذَلِكَ قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم لَا طَعَ لِلْمَخْلُوكِ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ there's no obedience, the Prophet said, there's no obedience to the creation if it constitutes disobedience to the Creator. <laughs> Imam Jassa says, this indicates that the corrupt individual cannot be a hakim, cannot be a leader. وَلَا تَنْفِذُوا إِذًا وَلِيُّ الْحُكُمْ he cannot be a ruler and his laws cannot be applied if he attains leadership. And in this same way, his testimony is not accepted. Nor will it be accepted if he said the Prophet said such and such. And his fatwa if he gives a fut fatwa, it will not be accepted. Who? Who? If he's a fasik. And who is a fasik according to the Quran? And according to this, la ta'a, there's no obedience, ni makhluk, for the, for the 
creation fi ma'siyat al-khaliq in disobedience to the khaliq as Allah himself also says the exact same thing wa man lam yahkum bima anzala Allah those who do not judge by the book of Allah fa ulaika humul fasiqun they are the fasiqin so that person that's a fasiq that does not pray does big sins the big sins like drink alcohol promote interest promote music uh at the at the large scale of the country right uh, promote uh, all these fahsha okay so such a person cannot be a khalifa this is imam jassas talking about the hanafi ruling on this issue okay then <clears throat> and he says وَمِنَ النَّاسِ أَن يَذُنُّ أَنَّ مَزْحَبْ أَبِ حَنِيفَ يَجُوز إِمَامُ الْفَاسِقِ He says amongst people there's some who say that the Abu Hanifa's mazhab allows a fasiq to be the imam وَالْخَلَافَةَ and, or, or to be a khalifa وَأَنَّهُ يُفَرِّقْ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ الْحَاكِمْ فَلَا يَجُوزْ حُكْمُهُ وَذَكَرَ ذَلِكْ أَنْ بَعْضَ الْمُكَلِّمِينَ وَهُوَ مُسَمَّلْ زَرْقَانْ وَقَدْ كَذَبَ فِي ذَلِكْ وَقَالَ وَقَالَ بِالْبَاطِلْ وَلَيْسَ هُوَ عَيْدًا And then, uh, I'm just going to read the English instead of translating. Some think that Abu Hanifa validates the rule of the corrupt imam and his caliphate and that he differentiates between him and the ruler. Some of the, amongst the Mukallimin mentioned this, such as Zulqan. He is a liar and has spoken falsehood in this regard. He is also one whose testimony is not to be accepted, meaning the Khalifa. There is no difference, according to Abu Hanifa, between the judge and the caliph. The judge has to be just, the caliph has to be just. In the condition that each of them, the to remain in their seat of authority is justice. Okay? So... The main thing is, for them to remain in their seat, they must have justice. Otherwise, they cannot be a khalifa. They cannot be a leader of the Muslims. They cannot be a judge of the Muslims. What to speak of being a khalifa? Okay. In the Abi Hanifa, between the Qadi and between the Khalifa, fi anna shart kull wahid minhuma adilan al adala. That adala, justice is the condition for being the Khalifa as well as to be a judge. So now you'd say, well, what does this have to do with rebellion? Okay, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. But what I want you to think about here is that, is there a reason the Salafi Mazhab, its holy grail is this condition that you cannot speak against the ruler? Why is this the case? Why is this their holy grail? Why why does this turn them off so much that if somebody speaks against the hakim of the time? When the Salaf did this, Abu Hanifa did this, Imam Malik did this, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal did this, Hassan and Hussein did this. <coughs> the Tawabin movement that took revenge for the death of Hussein radiallahu and did this. And you can go on. Because they want to say Quran and Sunnah, not because they're desirous of Quran and Sunnah. They want to say Quran and Sunnah so that you don't read something that will become a threat to their authority. And so that they can manipulate the Quran and Sunnah so you have to obey Allah and His Messenger and those that are in authority to you and apply that for themselves. And say that when the Prophet talked about listening and obeying an Amir, an Amir, not a secular king, an Amir. When the Prophet said you must listen and obey to the Amir even if he does injustice, he wasn't talking about the people that have assumed leadership. When the Prophet took bayah for his own leadership, the wordings of the bayah were that we will listen and obey. But the last statement there is... We will speak the truth wherever we are and we will not fear the blame of any blamer. This is in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Okay, so now let's just continue here. 
There's no difference according to Abu Hanifa between the judge and the caliph in that the condition for each of them to remain in their seat of authority is justice. This is something, of course, that if you were studying Abu Hanifa and came upon all these fatawas of his and his opinion about rebellion, which I'll talk about in a second, but if you came upon this, the king would be in trouble. So the king needs to cover that up. How can he cover that up? He can only cover that up by bypassing the entire history and saying, follow the salaf, follow the Quran and Sunnah, but actually listen to Bin Baz Usaymin and some of these other people. And they will neglect the entire history of 1,400 years. Their point of saying Quran and Sunnah is so that you go to Quran and Sunnah and then you go to the people that say Quran and Sunnah and leave everything in the entire 1,400 years of history out of the picture. And that the corrupt person can be neither a caliph nor a ruler. This is just how we reject his... This is just as how we reject his testimony and narrations. Okay? So if uh, MBS was to tell us uh, a, a, a verdict according to Islam, it would be rejected. If he said, the Prophet said something such and such, it would be rejected because if he's an evil doer, now, how, how can you judge somebody to be a judge without saying you're in, without judging that he's a fasik? Right? You have to make a judgment. Is he a fasik? If he's a fasik, his testimony is not accepted. If his testimony is not accepted, how can he be a khalifa? This is the point he's making here. How could he be a khalifa when his narrations are to be rejected? His rulings are not to be implemented. How could one attribute such an opinion to Abu Hanifa that he accepted these false rulers, these evil rulers? And he was when he was under duress from Ibn Hubayra during the day, uh, days of the Umayyad to be a judge. When he refused to comply, he was beaten and imprisoned. In order, so what happened is, because Abu Hanifa was very much against the Umayyads, so they they came up with this plan. Why don't we ask him to become the supreme judge? That way people will understand what? That Abu Hanifa is okay with what? With with the Umayyad empire, which he was not. He was not, and in fact he helped overthrow the Umayyads indirectly, but I'm not going to go into that right now. I just want to mention that when he was told, you become the Qadi, he said no. And he was lashed for that. And he was put in prison for that. Okay. And so he rebelled. Not only in that way. But let's continue now. Let me just now mention this very quickly. His mazhab, Imam Abu Hanifa, was well known regarding fighting oppressors and tyrannical rulers. And what I'm saying to you, dear brothers and sisters, and dear ulama of Dar al -Alum, the reason the Salafi Mazhab exists is because of these opinions and actions of Imam Abu Hanifa against cruel kings. They want to bypass Abu Hanifa specifically because he has the harshest rules against un unjust rulers. That's the reason. It has nothing to do whatsoever with the idea of Qur'an and Sunnah. Because if they wanted to study Qur'an and Sunnah, they would actually take from the A'imma and from their fatawa and consider them as part of the Salaf as they actually are. Rather than... See, think about this. Why do they have an allergic reaction to Abu Hanifa? Especially amongst all of them because he was the harshest to the king. And so... This is the reason. This is the real reasoning of why... You know, the kings are always very, uh, you can say, worried about the awam, the people. What will they, how will they react? So they need to be given an Islam that is tailored to, uh, to say, listen, obey to the king, and you will be on the righteous path of Tawheed, and you'll be on the righteous path of, you know, Quran and Sunnah. But don't say anything to us about our injustices, right? His mazhab is well known regarding fighting oppressors and tyrannical rulers. That's why Awza'i said, We used to tolerate everything from Abu Hanifa until he came with the sword, meaning his opinion regarding fighting oppressors. We This we didn't 
tolerate. Tolerate is the wrong word here. The word in the Arabic is ihtamala. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Kan mazhabul mashhur. Okay. His his mazhab is mashhur regarding qital of zulm and then aymatul jawr. The, the leaders that are oppressive. وَلِذَلِكَ قَالَ أَوْزَعِي أَوْزَعِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ وَنْ رَحْمَتُ اللَّهِ اِحْتَمَلْنَا أَبُوْ حَنِيفَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ We carried Abu Hanifa on all matters. Okay? حَتَّى إِجَاءَنَا بِالسَّيْفِ Until he came to us about the issue of fighting with the sword. يَعْنِي قِتَالْ أَذُلْمْ فَلَمْ نَحْتَمِلُهُ we couldn't carry that, meaning it was too hard for us to carry that. That's what it means. We couldn't tolerate that. In a sense, what he was asking us to do was very difficult. Now, I'm going to explain this to you in a little bit. <coughs> he said, Abu Hanifa said, it is wajib, meaning compulsory to do Amr bil Maruf, Nahyan al Munkar. And if you can't establish it with your word, if they, if you can't bring the enjoining good and forbidding the evil, meaning the, removing the injustice with your words, then you must do it with your sword. This is what Abu Han, this is Imam Jassas, the great Hanafi jurist, his understanding of Abu Hanifa. Okay. So I'm just going to, Go to the English over here. That's why Awzai said we used to tolerate, meaning everything for Abu Hanifa, until he came to us with the sword, meaning his opinion regarding fighting the oppressors. This we couldn't tolerate in a sense. We couldn't hold up to this. It, was, it would be very difficult to do this. He, Abu Hanifa, used to say, enjoining good and forbidding evil is compulsory by speech. And if it doesn't work, then by the sword, based on what was narrated from the Prophet ﷺ. Ibrahim, who is one of the jurists, from Khorasan asked Abu Hanifa about enjoining good and forbidding evil. So he said, it's compulsory. And when he told him about the hadith of Akrama, okay. Now this hadith of Akrama that Abu Hanifa narrated is also in the Musnad of Imam Abu Hanifa. Meaning it's in his Musnad and he, he, he himself is the listener and the reporter of this hadith. He then told him about the hadith of Akrama on the authority of Ibn Abbas that the Prophet said, وسلم, the best martyrs are Hamza ibn Abdul al Mutalib and a man who stands up to a tyrant and enjoins him to do good and forbid him from evil. And then he is killed as a result. So Ibrahim, who was a Qadi, who had a problem with the injustices of the Khalifa, so Ibrahim returned and went to Abi Muslim, who was the head of the state, and rebuked him for his oppression and spilling of blood unjustly. He was tol tolerated a few times, but then eventually killed. Now he's talking about the event where Imam Abu Hanifa gave assistance to Zayd bin Ali. As you know, the uh, family of the Prophet ﷺ was the first to stand up against the oppression of the Umayyads, the kings. And so Hussein was killed as a result. The grandson of Abu Bakr was killed as a result. And other companions of the Prophet were killed as a result. So when his grandson Zayd bin Ali okay, stood up against the Umayyad Empire, his assistance to Zayd bin Ab Ali is well known. He used to provide him with money and secretly give fatwas to people regarding the obligation to fight him and make him victorious. Also, his involvement in the affair of Muhammad bin Ibrahim bin Abdullah Hassan is well known. Meaning these were people that after, uh, after Zayd bin Ali عنه, was killed, other people from the family of the Prophet came forward. But then Abu Hanifa, and I'm just mentioning this here very quickly, Abu Hanifa held the opinion after that, that you, it is compulsory to fight the oppressors, number one. Number two, only do that once you know you have enough power that it doesn't create a situation of anarchy. Okay, It doesn't create a situation of fawda, of anarchy. So you create a jama when you have enough people in the jama, they're powerful enough, and you are sure your army has a good chance of winning only then. Otherwise, hold your silence, kufu aidiyakum, keep your hands tied. Okay? But that is khuruj bis safe. We're not even but as far as 
meaning Abu Hanifa is okay even with that under certain conditions. What to speak of speaking against the Khalifa if he's doing wrong? And secretly gave fatwas to people regarding the obligation to fight with him and make him victorious. Also his involvement in the affair of Muhammad and Ibrahim bin Abdullah Hassan is well known when Abi Ishaq Farazi said to him, Why did you refer to my brother who rebelled with Ibrahim until he got killed? So he responded back, Your brother's rebellion is more beloved to me than yours. Abu Ishaq went to Basra and the Ashabul Hadith rebuked him who have lost their ambition to enjoining good and forbidding evil until the, and this is what Jassas is writing, until the oppressors were able to overcome and abolish the affairs of Islam. And so over here, just want that to be. فَقَدَ أَمَرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنَيْهَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ حَتَّى تَغْلَبَ الظَّالِمُونَ عَلَىٰ أَمُورِ الْإِسْلَامِ this is what happened. The oppressors came over the issues of Islam. And why did that happen? Because they were not, the enjoining good and forbidding was stopped. So when you do that, then that's what happened. Social justice will not prevail. And what these people are saying is there should, we should not talk about. So social justice can't happen without criticizing the status quo, the people in charge, what they're doing wrong. Right? Like Umar radiallahu one was challenged. Okay, he was taken to court. Ali was taken to court. So the point being that uh, why do the Salafi brothers, why have they been brainwashed to oppose Abu Hanifa specifically? The reason is, the real reason is, the real reason behind the scenes is not because they're the, 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 the kings are interested in you following Quran and Sunnah. No. It is because the kings don't want you to study this history. They don't want you to study these fatawas. They don't want you to study and give credence to something that would go against their their desires or their puppet master's desires in the last 1400 years. So you have a very good, you know, uh, you can say slogans. Uh, we are against bid'ah and we're for tawheed and we're for this and we're for that. But you're not for Khilafah. You're not for Amr bil Maruf, Nahin al Munkar, enjoining good and forbidding wrong. You're not for a society based upon justice because you can't do that if you're not criticizing. If people are not allowed to criticize, then how can that happen? If you don't have a court system in which you can challenge the wrongs of that system, if you don't have a court system that can challenge the wrongs of that system, you don't have a court system. If you're doing what the Prophet ﷺ said, that Allah's punishment comes when? When the upper class is treated differently than the lower class. That when somebody from the upper class does a crime, they're not punished. And when the person from the lower class does a crime and he's punished. When you create, when you allow such a situation to be created. And so all these, uh, you know, Salafi brothers that have good ambitions and maybe goodwill towards Islam. But they're not realizing how they're being used for an agenda of someone else. And, you know, they're taught this is the land of Tawheed and they're taught this kind of like love for Saudi Arabia, uh, and which is easy to do because everyone loves Mecca and Medina. And then you see, okay, Saudi Arabia is the, uh, is, is, is like almost the inherit, quote unquote, inheritor of Mecca and Medina. Like, who would know Islam better than the people, than the, the place where Islam came out from. But nothing can be far, farther from the truth. And the Holy Grail, as Brother Haji uh, has, has said, uh, the Holy Grail of the Salaf, the Salafi movement, the Mudkhali movement, not all Salafi brothers, because you have Sheikh Safar Hawali who criticized, you have Sheikh Suleiman Auda, for example. You have many great Salafi scholars. I, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with the Saudi agenda using the Salafi mazhab to create a certain tailored Islam that is, um, that is, that is, that, that is, that is, you could say congruent with the puppet masters that is in, uh, in, um, in the good books of the puppet master, right? And their own good books that you don't speak, you don't do protests. Like this has been a big one. Protests are haram. This is khuruj and this is rebellion. What are you talking? You don't know what Abu Hanifa did? Okay. 
So are you going to say that, uh, you no, know, it's okay if Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab did khuruj against the Ottomans, but it's not okay if somebody held a protest for the wrongs that Saudi Arabia has been doing? These people, they love the Saudi kingdom uh, in, instead of loving Islam. And they don't realize the difference between the two. And what they don't realize is that they're not, following the children of the Sahaba, which is the first two, three generations, but they're following people that came after the children of Sahaba who wrote Bukhari and Muslim, which is also good. They're all, may Allah, Imam Bukhari. That's not the point. The point is, don't say we're Salafi when you're not following the Salaf. The only people, the, the true Salafis are those who are actually, actually following the people of the first three generations. So when you say Sheikh bin Baz said this and Sheikh Uthaymin said this and Sheikh such and such said this and when we say Imam Abu Hanifa said this, Imam Malik said this, Imam Shafi said this, you have a problem with us mentioning the people of the Salaf and you have an allergic reaction to that. But the real reason is, the real reason, the real reason why you have a problem with the Hanafi Thiqah is not because of Rafa'i Dain or because of where we put our hands in our Salaf or because the Prophet prayed this way or this way, or if the Prophet said, Amin louder. That's not the reason. Okay, that's not the reason. The reason is you want to take away from the masses the ability to protest or say, say the king is doing something wrong. That's the real issue. That is why the Saudi kingdom chose this version of Islam to be pushed on its masses because it suited the desires of the kings. And this becomes more apparent. How does this become more apparent? This becomes more apparent when you meet the students of Medina and you talk to them and you see how they defend Saudi Arabia. And they think that their defense of Saudi Arabia is defense of Islam. And how these people defend Saudi Arabia and the Saudi Saudi king as if he is a Muslim leader and uh, an elected, uh, you know, he has bayar from the Muslimin and as if he leads us in salah and as if he gives Jummah khutbas and as if he does no evil. So this is the reason, the real political, historical reason, two reasons, primarily. Number one, the Ottomans practice the Hanafi fiqh. Number two, they don't want their students studying things that would end up, if they studied the life of the kings, of, of the ulama, of Imam Nawi, for example, how he was against the, he, that's how he literally died, opposing the king. He had to leave his city. How many scholars died because they opposed the kings of their time? Read the life of Mujad al Alfsani. Read the life of Shaulila Muhaddas Delvi. Read the life of Sheikh al Hind, Sheikh al Islam, Mahmoud al Hassan. Read the life of Uthman Dan Folio. Read the life of these great scholars. They don't want a Malcolm X in Saudi Arabia. They don't want a Saudi Malcolm X. They just want you, they want to use religion to pacify you, to tell you. Do whatever, the, just bear with the king no matter what he does wrong. No matter what he does against Allah. No matter what he does against Islam. He can take away the sacred sites of Islam away. Bring interest and create a war against Allah. But you remain silent. Don't say anything. Don't protest against the king. This has become the Salafi agenda now. And this is why I'm harping on this. Okay, I think uh, we can come to an end on this issue. Let me see if there's something else I want to show you here. And in the book of Musayyirah, one of the books of Fatawa, then we do not remove him. يستحق, it is rightful. يعزل إلم يستازم فتنة. It is rightful to remove him if, as long as there will be no fitna. And this is where I was talking about Abu Hanifa's fatwa. Rebel against the king as long as you know you have the power to win.
ويجب أن يدعى له ولا يجب خروج عليه and do dua for him and rebellion should not be made against such a person وكذا أن أبو حنيفة this is the opinion of Abu Hanifa. Now, let me make this very clear. There is a big difference, a world of difference between these leaders of today and the leaders of the days before the pre-industrial age. Because these leaders that Abu Hanifa is talking about, they didn't have puppet masters. They weren't uh, intellectually brainwashed. So you cannot have how do you know how do you know if a judgment should be different because if you can prove the situation is different and i think very easily anybody with two cents of a brain can know there's a big difference between the the cruel muslim kings of before and what uh the the puppet mas the 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 puppets of the master today you know the cruel kings even though they were cruel uh but what happened, Musta'asim, for example, Musta'asim Billah, he heard a Muslim lady has been kidnapped in the area of Sindh. What happened? He sent his army. Because he had certain izza, certain honor for him and his people, even though he was cruel and did wrong things. But he's, he, was not, he wasn't a puppet of another master. Right, So if you tolerated that and you didn't have a way to oppose him and replace him with someone pious, then that's what Allah willed. That's fine. But don't tell me you can't speak against these puppets who follow their puppet masters. They don't even, this is not even like a discussion in our old fiqh books because this was something that couldn't even be assumed in the in prior to the times that we live in. So I'll end there, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa